anyway, I, I want to move it along. I want to introduce Dr. Leonor Fernandez. When you, I, I think her name may appear as CTs when you hear her voice, but this is her smiling face, so you know what she looks like. And um, and Dr. Fernandez is an educator and internist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Ann, assist, assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Her clinical work, research, and leadership work is focused on patient-centered care and health equity. And then in partnership with Open Notes, her work is focused on helping patients from all backgrounds use open notes to communicate more clearly with clinicians and be empowered and meaningfully engaged in healthcare. I'm really excited to learn from her today. Um, here is Dr. Fernandez. Thank you so much, Liz. And um, hopefully uh, my audio is working. Um, and thank you to the whole open notes team and CT. Um, for sort of the incredible vision that the open notes uh, change has brought to medicine. So next slide. Um, I wanna say I have no disclosures. I'm not obligated to anything other than to my values, my family and my dog here. And I also wanna direct the audience that there's a good uh, webinar that you can watch with my colleagues, Jared, Jeremy, and Steve. And some of what we're talking about today builds upon that. And here are some of their references that I think are really, really useful. So please watch that. So building upon what CT said, you know, we all know that the traditional role for notes was to convey information to others on the care team and, and to ourselves to remind ourselves what, what, what took place. And I also think there's a big point about it notes, writing notes, actually helping clinicians kind of consolidate their thinking, this metacognition concept. And in fact, there'll often be times that as I write my note, I realize, oh gosh, I forgot about the TSH and telling her to do this. And I also might, as I make more clear my argument for why I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, refine in some way my diagnostic thinking. Um, it also establishes a reviewable record um, and increasingly for quality purposes and of course for legal purposes. And now the next one, which we don't love, which is that it also provides evidence of service for billing. And yeah, and if you can go to the next slide, um, Amanda, exactly right, which is I put this in big block letters because this issue of the role of providing evidence of service for billing and the regulations around ev evaluation and management, so-called, was a very big contributor to what we call note bloat, which is that the content of our notes have been shaped by these billing requirements, which at the at the time, up until January 1st, uh, required you know seven elements from the history. You have to put have six organ systems in the physical, and just this relatively, in my opinion, medieval way of thinking about what you're documenting, almost in a in a checklist way that just isn't the way clinicians think, and it really kind of obscured. And, and contributed to note blow. It obscured the clarity of notes. And this occurred in, in, in a change in how EMRs work. And we know that EMRs have been incredibly valuable in terms of this very issue now of easy transmissibility of information, of labs, of notes, of everything, and of doing population health, of, of systems being able to understand the needs of our patients in in aggregate numbers, um, but it also has created an enormous administrative burden and pr a proportion of our time now attached to documentation and the computer that has created a, a, a resentment almost, and sometimes a lack of alignment between uh, what clinicians are most interested in doing and what, what they are doing and also a lack of alignment, as you'll see, between what clinicians are doing and what their patients need. So uh, Atul Gawande, by the way, points this out in ways that are just so beautiful to read in the New Yorker, so I recommend that here. Next one. 
So going back to dogs, whom I love, um, I love dogs because they are present in the moment um, and they care about things that matter. And that's, I think, part of what we all love about them. And I think that in our best days, we wish that we as clinicians could be that. So what I most love and why I went into medicine is to care and for and about and with patients um, and to think about science and how that relates to my communication process, to think about differential and analytics about uh, what is causing something um, and management. But what we're finding now in the next slide of the atlas of our current brain is instead of being occupied with that, sometimes while we're writing notes and even while we're present with the patient, there's a lot going on that distracts a little bit from the process. So they, uh, I'm thinking about my population health checklist. Did I close the gaps? So let me put in this smart phrase one. Was it smart phrase seven? And, and let me import half my last note because I need to for these documentation requirements. And did I list all of the ones I have to, they're going to audit me. And if I don't finish this now, then I have to do it at home. And then I'll have to do it after the kids go to sleep. And then I'm really tired. I can't remember half of what we talked about. And this is not unfamiliar uh, to many of you, uh, at least to me in primary care. Um, so if we can go to the next one. So I think part of this came from that distortion I was saying that luckily to some degree, I think we've been liberated from by the, the old requirements are here on the left and the new requirements that instead of focusing on all these elements really are gonna hinge on the complexity of decision making or the time we spend with the patient. Um, and maybe this is an opportunity for that alignment between what patients need and what we need. So next slide. So the, what patients need and what Open Notes has successfully demonstrated very clearly is that notes reinforce patient's understanding and can increase their sense of control over their health and enable patients to play an important part in this quality loop with wonderful uh, work by um, Seagal Bell in our, in, in our, in our group. Um, also, it, we see a lot of signals that it enhances the relationship between clinician and patient, particularly when there may be elements of, uh, of difficulty with trust. This may be particularly important to do by that transparency. I also, going back to metacognition, I think that the fact that we know that there's a chance that our patients will read our notes may improve our own ability and tendency to consider the patient's perspective more actively because we're thinking about that in the narrative and therefore we may think about it more in our plans. So next slide. We all know about the so-called SOAP note, which refers to putting the subjective, what the patient has said or, or brought to the visit first, objective, the physical exam or vital signs, et cetera, and then the assessment and plan. And there's been some move to maybe since the assessment and plan is kind of the nitty gritty of what's going to happen and the integral of what took place to move that up at the top. So those are called APSO notes. Um, I think as we debate these things, um, I think we should be thinking, as CT does very actively all the time, what ways could the EMR be designed in ways that will make notes more helpful to all of us, including patients who clearly are the audience as well now and part of what we should design for. So next slide. So. Um, in the same way that in New York, um, on the west side of Manhattan, there was an old railroad line and it was uh, for freight and it stopped being used and then it had been grown over and it was uh, not even safe, was then redesigned to create the High Line, uh, which then became an area of sort of environmental uh, sustainability as well as green space that is needed in a city. And it had to be designed in ways that, of course, people of different physical abilities could use it. And so 
all these advantages that come and many uses that can come from something where intention is put into diverse function, okay? So the same way, next slide, we could think about our notes and how we can redesign them and maybe have um, an explication of things so that I don't have to spend my time writing out shortness of breath, even though I should instead of SOB, but rather that the, 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 the EMR knows how to do that as it does in some systems, or that it can take CHF and say congestive heart failure and also have a hyperlink to explain that to patients um, in, in, in meaningful uh, lay language. So uh, this slide is to show that we know that systems can change dramatically when they need to. So this shows a slide of how overnight, literally, our system at Beth Israel Deaconess had a change so that uh, because of COVID, so that we could deliver telehealth after March 13th. And the green is the percent of visits that were now telehealth, mostly telephone at the beginning, and now increasingly video. So when we align the fact that it was necessary for public health, that that's the only way we'll take care of our patients and that's the only way we'll get paid, then the system can innovate. So it's about aligning incentives in addition to how we express it to leadership. So, um, however, we learned other things about uh, ourselves when we did this, and new slide. So, uh, next slide, sorry. Um, this is a slide by my colleague, my wonderful colleague, Jorge Rodriguez, who did uh, a study in the partner system, MGB system, um, and found, uh, it's a complicated slide, but just to summarize, uh, showing access to video visits. And this shows on the top that patients who were white had much more likelihood of getting a, a, of actually accessing a video visit and having a video visit than patients who were black, say, or Hispanic or other, you see them listed there. The same when you looked at issues of language that the Spanish speakers um, in Boston here had the, the lowest rate of being able to access it. And then um, in terms of age, that older patients had less. Uh, access. And we know from other studies that also this runs along uh, income because of issues of digital access and digital literacy. Now, why do I raise this? Because this is a perfect signal and marker to us regarding what we need to think about in order to have these notes be of use to the wide universe of our patients. And we know that it's not just patients with the um, highest income who are interested in having access to notes. We know from many surveys that a wide variety of patients would love to be able to see their notes and, a wide, and, and that it, it, it may even have a higher impact on trust in a lot of, of, of those patients. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, so we know that digital equity requires action. We need to be building intentionally with design for marginalized populations. We need to systematically offer not just clinicians, but the system needs to offer to every patient. We need to support them so they can do this. And that is a whole nother talk we can have another time. And we need to track and identify the disparities actively. So when you measure them, you can address them. Um, and this is a great resource from Courtney Lyles. Um, next slide. So I know you're getting, you wanna know, well, okay, just tell me how to write better notes. So um, again, I do think engaging patients and telling them personally when you see them, yeah, listen, I want you to know that I'm offering, that we're offering the notes and read them and give me feedback and, and tell me if there's a mistake. I, I totally wanna know that. Um, and physically, we know nonverbal communication is often more important than verbal. And so angling the computer when you're in a visit so that the patient can see it, just even if they're not reading, actually communicates transparency. Uh, some people dictate in front of the patient, which can work um, if they speak uh, English, if you're dictating in English. So next slide. Um, 
So uh, we want to listen and note the patient's key concerns respectfully. They want to know you listened, use the correct pronoun, have a systematic way to ask that, and include the patient's perspective respectfully, particularly if you don't agree or you see things slightly differently, even more a time to write in some individuality about how the patient, and, and respectfully and professionally, about how the patient expressed that. Next slide. We being clear, less is usually more, avoiding this note blow. I don't think we shouldn't be importing the social history if we didn't elicit it or review it ourselves. Uh, use language that mirrors how we speak in the office and think about the degree of granularity when there are sensitive details about um, a variety of stigmatized topics or topics that are sensitive for this particular patient. Not all ex details are necessary. You may want to talk about that with the patient. Next slide. Um, and finally, just to use supportive and empathic language. And uh, CT's um, sheet is really helpful. But basically, I think of it like, how's this going to sound to my patient? It sounds simple, but that is the best guide avoiding certain stigmatizing terms I'll talk about, including what the patient is actually doing working towards their goals. So just to quickly draw upon some research that we've done, um, we have found that when you ask patients two questions, did you feel offended ever or did you ever feel judged by something you read in a note, about a little over 10% said yes in this survey, which had 29,000, over 29,000 respondents that um, was alluded to. Next slide. Um, and what we um, found is that um, these are just uh, a word cloud of the adjectives that in a free text response, when we ask them, the, the respondents to tell us, well, what, what was it that made you feel judged or offended, that they described what it was. And as you can see, obese, incorrect, wrong, inaccurate, elderly, sexual, anxious, you can get the feeling a little bit just by the word cloud of the kinds of things that came up. So we do need to evolve. And when we did a more systematic thematic analysis, we, we grouped them from what we saw into three big domains, which are disrespect on the left purple, errors and breaches of trust, so to speak, that the patient found, and labels um, that when the patient felt labeled. Um, and in more granular um, fashion on the right, you know, it was either about a mistake, not feeling heard, um, or feeling that they were misquoted, um, labeling, descriptions. Elderly is actually very unpopular. Um, medical idioms like patient refused that CT said, or a lot of words we use that sound very skeptical, uh, denied even. Um, is it sounds skeptical to patients. Um, oh, uh, obesity um, came up a lot and other stigmatized topics around mental health and alcohol and drug use. And a, generally a condescending tone came up a lot um, or objectifying tone. Um, and next, uh, next slide. Um, so um, in terms of some of these CT already mentioned, but the concept that patients don't like to think of obesity as an identity. Um, it can be documented as a patient's BMI. Uh, the same for diabetes. It's a condition, not an adjective uh, of um, in adherence. Uh, rather than non-compliant, describing people's behavior and learning more about why they're doing what they're doing. And then in drug use disorders, um, you know, um, not putting alcoholic, IV drug abuser, um, not saying urine is negative or positive, instead saying um, not, uh, 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 I'm sorry, not saying clean or dirty, but instead saying the urine is negative for, or positive for X substances, sorry. And again, a reference down there that I found really helpful from my colleagues, um, Godou, uh, Anu Godou and, and Mary Catherine Peach and others that really explains how we transmit bias, not just to the patient, but to other clinicians when we use some of this language and it changes the decisions that clinicians make about 
for the patient uh, uh, when we use this sort of stigmatizing labeling words. So it's quite important. Um, next slide. Um, so for take home points, I wanna make the point that honestly, I still think the thing that matters most is how we are in terms of being present with the patient when we are with the patient. That matters most and will allow patients to forgive a lot of my clumsiness at times or messiness in my notes. Um, and so, and patients will interpret notes, I believe, in the context of the pre existing relationship. We don't have the full data around that, but that is our impression. Um, but uh, essentially, with respect to the note, basically document the patient's perspective, think of the tone, don't surprise the patient. When not sure, just mirror the way you would speak in the office. That's going to get you right for most things, including mental health issues. And, um, and remember that basically what patients want makes sense, which is they want the note to reflect the visit and they want the visit to reflect the note. I think that this will let us align more and more um, so that what we need as clinicians, so that we don't get burnt out, so that we can feel present in, in, in a visit um, is, is, is the expectations for notes to change and some of, of, of how we arrange um, the ability of patients to participate and make use of the notes. And when we align the patient's needs with clinician needs, we all, we all gain. So thank you and I'll stop uh, there. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. And just a reminder, even though it says CT Lynn below her video camera, that is Dr. Fernandez.